So the uh, next talk uh, will be about reusable two-round MPC uh, from the DDH assumption. And uh, this is joint work by James Bartosek, Sanjam Gark, Daniel Masny, and Partai Mukherjee. And uh, yeah, James will give the talk. So uh, yeah, have fun. OK, so thanks. Yeah, um, we'll be talking about this recent work, uh, reusable two-round MPC. Um, so, uh, yeah, so two round MPC. So the, the setting that we're considering uh, in this work is, uh, as usual, we're, we're going to have a set of parties, uh, each with their own private input, and they're going to wish to compute a joint circuit on their inputs. Um, and we'll be, uh, you know, our goal is round optimal approaches, and to do that, we'll be uh, assuming access to a broadcast channel. Uh, and to specify the adversary we're considering, it's the, the usual uh, dishonest majority setting. Um, so the adversary can corrupt up to n minus one of these parties. Um, so we'll be restricting it to be polynomial time. And uh, you know we'll be considering um, the two uh, common uh, security uh, notions of semi-honest and malicious security. Okay, so so yeah, so why why study two round MPC? I mean, um, so interaction uh, is really one of like the major uh, measures of efficiency you might want to optimize in MPC, along with maybe communication and computation. Um, and two round MPC really represents like the really is the most optimal thing you can do in terms of interaction, um, because. Um, it's been folklore for a while that MPC in one round is just impossible to achieve for general functionalities. Um, and so, you know, well, why study reusable two round MPC? Well, what is reusable two round MPC? It's really taking, um, you know, minimizing, minimizing interaction even further um, without like, without hitting that one round lower bound. So it's really kind of represents the minimal interaction pattern you can have in MPC. And it's basically saying that you know parties can send a first message, um, and then that first message can be reused across um, multiple or unbounded number of second round executions, each on a potentially different um, circuit. So, um, you know, just to visualize this, um, so you know we have a set of parties. In the first round, they each say broadcast a single message depending on their input. Um, and then at a later point, like say they want to compute some circuit C, now they can, can do this completely like non-interactively. They can each release uh, a second round message um, that can be combined to learn the output of this, this circuit. Um, and moreover, they can kind of keep doing this. Say they want to compute a second circuit later, they can do the same thing non-interactively um, and so on. So I don't know, it's a pretty uh, uh, natural interaction pattern. Um, to, to study in MPC um, because it's really kind of the most uh, non-interactive, it's kind of the, the minimal amount of interaction you can really hope for because of because just a single round is impossible. Um, so yeah, I'll go, I'll go through quickly some, basically the prior and concurrent work on two round MPC, highlighting uh, which approaches are reusable. Um, uh, so really there's two main approaches to achieving two round MPC. The first is based on multi-key fully homomorphic encryption um, as, uh, as shown uh, by this work of Mukherjee and Wicks. Um, and so this is an orange, so this is also reusable. Um, and there's actually a, uh, a concurrent independently to us. There's a work that showed how to basically improve uh, Mukherjee Wicks results um, in some sense. Um, by removing the uh, CRS in the semi honest setting. Okay. Um, also reusable. So the second main approach uh, to two round MPC is based on this notion of a round compressing and compiler, which was introduced in this work of GGHR. And they showed how to uh, you know, build this assuming indistinguishability obfuscation. And this, this has led to a, a long line of work. I'm, I will be only mentioning a couple here, but a line of work that is, that is kind of a uh, uh, optimize this approach, this approach in terms of assumptions needed. Um, so Garg and Srinivasan give, gave a, a, a method for instantiating this round compressing compiler with bilinear maps. 
and then uh, later um, GS again, and then and Ben Hamuda and Lin um, gave a way to, instan to instantiate this with just the minimal assumption of two round of Livius transfer. And so, you know, as you can see, these these later works that don't rely on obfuscation actually uh, lose the uh, reusability of the first message. Okay. Um, and again, I will mention a, another concurrent independent work actually shows how to take this bilinear map approach and, and make it reusable. Okay. Um, but uh, where our result fits in is in this is also in the second approach uh, based on a round compressing compiler. We show how to, um, you know, basically instantiate this approach using um, just the DDH assumption um, while maintaining reusability. So, you know, the main result is assuming DDH um, in the uh, semi ana setting, we get a two round reusable protocol in the plane model. And in the militia setting, um, as usual, uh, we, you know, as usual in the two round setting, we get a, a reusable protocol in the CRS model. Um, so this is kind of, this is our main result. Um, and basically what we take as our starting point, uh, specifically the, the two round MPC protocol of Gargan Srinivasan. Um, so without going into really any details all, at all about how this protocol works, um, a kind of a high level view of it is that in the first round, uh, every pair of parties, um, exchanges a, a set of OT1 messages. Okay, so every pair of parties sends to each other um, a set of oblivious transfer messages um, where the choice bits that they use or where the, yeah, the receiver like choice bits that they use are kind of determined based on their input and some of, and their random points, okay? Um, and in the second round, each party just releases a sequence of garbled circuits kind of based on these exchanged uh, OT1 messages in the first round. So that's just a very high level template and so, you know, why is this not reusable? Well, the, the issue is that, well, there's a couple issues. Um, first is that the number of OT messages that these parties have to exchange in the first round actually grows with the size of the circuit that they want to compute in the second round. Okay. Um, so there needs to be a certain number of OT messages exchanged per gate in the circuit that they'll eventually compute. Um, and moreover, like these OT messages, you can't really reuse them for multiple gates or for multiple computations. Um, because these, the garbled circuits in, that are used in the second round actually release, end up releasing some of the randomness used to um, compute these OT1 messages, rendering them kind of useless for uh, future computations. Um, but, you know, a natural approach to try to, uh, to take this template and make it reusable is, well, could we actually, instead of just exchanging, just like, a set of OT messages, can we somehow use the first round to generate for each pair of players like an unbounded polynomial number of OT correlations, which they can then use um, in the second round. Um, so, you know, uh, this is like, this is what we want to do. Basically uh, have, you know, these parties exchange some set of messages that then allow them to like, like on the fly, um, create a, a huge amount of OT correlations um, that will be useful in the second round. Um, so really uh, the main tool that we use to do this is um, homomorphic secret sharing, um, which was uh, this primitive uh, introduced by um, Boyle, um, Gilboa and Ashai in 2016. Um, it's a two-party primitive. And so this is, uh, this is what it is. There's a dealer. Um, who has uh, some secret S and this dealer can um, like secret share the secret um, to, to two parties um, using a special secret sharing scheme. And now say the parties want to compute some circuit C over the, over the secret. Um, HSS comes along with this evaluation algorithm that each party can use to evaluate on their individual shares to produce um, this, this pair of output shares. Um, and the correctness property is stating that th these output shares simply XOR to the value C of S. Okay. So, you know, these parties don't, don't learn anything about S from their individual share, but if you combine their output shares, then they can learn um, what C of S is. And moreover, this, this combination can be done in a, a very simple way, um, which is, turns out to be, I think, 
usually quite important for applications of HSS that like this, this reconstruction is simply XOR. Um, so, uh, so BGI uh, in 2016, they showed how to construct this um, from the DDH assumption, as long as the circuit C is, is, is log depth, um, is, is an NC1. And uh, a caveat to this is there this this correctness uh, requirement I showed here. It's it's only it's um, you know ideally you'd, you'd want it to hold with at least overwhelming probability, um, but their construction only shows how to do this uh, where this, this 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 holds with probability one minus one over poly. And so this is also something this is kind of something that usually needs to be dealt with um, in various ways when when building um, things from HSS. Okay. Um, so yeah, recall what our goal was. I mean, basically to, to in the first round, generate a huge number of, of OT correlations that can then be used in the second round of, of GS18. And on this slide, I'll basically show how to, how to use HSS to generate a huge number of, of random OT correlations. Um, a random OT correlation is simply the sender gets two random, uniformly random strings, R0 and R1. The receiver gets a random bit B and then the string RB. Okay. So I will say that you know, in order to, to instantiate GS18, we need something a little bit more structured than just simply like random OT correlations. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'll show how to just do random OT correlations. Um, and this is basically going to be you know, an instantiation. What we're basically um, uh, using is a, uh, this notion of a pseudorandom correlation generator, or this is like an instantiation of a pseudorandom correlation generator, um, which has been like uh, introduced and studied in some recent works. Um, so, so we're gonna have like, like, cause HSS is this primitive that operates in this dealer model where we have a dealer. So for now, you know, um, kind of assume we're just gonna have a dealer in our MPC protocol and we'll kind of, uh, we'll see later how to remove that dealer. But so here we have a dealer and a sender and a receiver, and we want um, what we're going to do is have the dealer choose uh, two PRF keys, uh, one associated to each of these parties, the sender and the receiver. Okay, and uh, the PRF key KS is going to have a range um, of lambda bit strings, and KR is just going to have a, the range of one bit strings. And so the dealer is going to send a Okay, we lost James. I guess we'll have to wait. Uh, Peter, shall we wait for a minute or two until yeah, let's hope that James can get back his connection and rejoin. Yeah. Um, uh, it, now he's left. Eduardo is suggesting that I do uh, PowerPoint karaoke, but unfortunately I don't have his slides and unfortunately I don't know the results uh, in as much detail as James. So. But maybe we can take uh, that moment while James is not here to uh, check uh, Julio's setup. If that's okay, Peter. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me fine? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So I just try to share my screen. Let's see. See if I manage to not share any sensitive content. Yep, we see the PDF. Like this. Fantastic. Hey. And James is yeah. back. So, uh, sorry about soon? that. No yeah. problem. Uh, we lost you when you were uh, talking about the uh, two PRFs that are right. used. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my computer just crashed. So, hopefully, that doesn't happen again. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, I was ready to substitute you, but uh, no, no, no. I want we all want to listen to the talk to the end. So 
there's there's a lot uh, uh, of interesting stuff that's going to happen. So, James, if you're ready. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was talking about um, yeah. So the the dealer is, is is so share these two PRF keys, right? Or sorry, sent one PRF key to each of the each of these players, and also using HSS secret shares um, the concatenation of these two keys. Okay, and now say that the uh, say that these parties basically want to use this 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 short message to generate, um, say, their ith correlation. What they're going to do is they're going to use uh, the HSS eval algorithm to compute this, this function under HSS, um, which is just simply evaluating um, the SPRF on i, um, and then out either outputting that value or all zeros, depending on the value of the, the RPRF. OK, so this notation just means you evaluate um, KR and then repeat the bit uh, lambda times, whether it's zero or one. Okay, so the result of evaluating this function will either be uh, the the value of the KS PRF or all zeros. Okay, and so the sender, so we want the sender to basically somehow create two strings um, out of this information. So the sender is going to simply set its string R zero to be the the output share from HSS Z zero. And it's going to set its other string R1 to be this guy uh, XORed with the PRF value um, KS, which it can compute because it has this key. Okay. Um, on the other hand, the receiver, the receiver's choice bit is going to going to be its own PRF value, um, the bit B, and it's going to set its string to be its its HSS output share. So um, we can kind of quickly check correctness um, for the two. The two cases where b is equal to zero or one. Um, if b is equal to zero, uh, note that this this function uh, just evaluates to zero, right? And so that means by the correctness of HSS, assume for now it's perfectly correct. Uh, you know, that means that these guys, these output shares, have to XOR to zero, which means they're equal, right? So in that case, R b is equal to actually z one is equal to z zero, which is equal to R zero. On the other hand, uh, if b is equal to one, then these output shares XOR to the PRF value of KS on i, right? So in that case, um, RB is actually equal to this value, um, Z0 XOR the PRF um, KS of i, which is actually um, exactly R1. Okay, so this is, you know, this is how they can generate. This starts to be a habit. Computer crashed again. Mm, good question. I think this HSS is not resilient to reboot attacks. <laughs> I agree, Peter. Sorry. Hello, Ivan. Yeah, Peter, can you, can you, uh, as expert, this sort of thing, can you just continue to talk from here? <laughs> I was actually curious to see where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I can't. Yeah. We were already uh, thinking, Ivan, that in case, uh, uh, if, if this if this uh, would happen again, maybe you could play a little uh, tune for the break on the violin. I can post a random video replaying music somewhere. I guess, but I, I guess that would be a little bit beside the point. The point here, I mean, there's not much random OT correlation about that. Can you can you write a a, a piece about a random OT? A tune, you mean? A, a musical version that that expands in your head well into a longer piece 
but even <laughs> never uses random strings, right? So I suppose I suppose I mean I, if if I would would generate a musical version of this, it would be like so. Suppose me and, me and my good friend, uh, who I played with for many years, would would both start from from the same, uh, you know, a little piece of a tune. Then we would independently compose something and play it at the same time. Then it would, by magic, just sound good together. Uh, so the principle of a jam session. Yes. So except that we're not supposed to to listen to each other. It would just oh. sound, you know, good just by magic, but just because of the correlation that we had initially, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like this idea. I like this idea. I I I, I smell rump session talk. I know some people where, where it might actually work for to some extent. Hello again. Okay, sorry about that. I think um, I actually just switched computers. I think that, that, actually, was, a computer, that was a new computer, so that's kind of, um, that's not good. So anyways, I'm gonna use this older computer. Hopefully this will actually work. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah. Um, okay, so just, 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 just for me to uh, shamefully uh, ask here, uh, if you can go to that uh, on that slide. Uh, yeah, this one. Exactly. Uh, should R be that should be Z B right? It's not Z one. Oh, Z. It should be Z. So Z one is just the output that R gets. Okay. Are you are you asking about this right here? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, this is this should be Z one, um, because uh, never, never mind, never mind. I was overlooking something. Anything, anyway. Um, yeah, uh, James, take it away. Take three. Okay. Hopefully, this time I'll be able. Okay. All right. So this is uh, yeah. So that I just got finished explaining how how to basically generate an unbounded polynomial number of of random OT correlations using HSS. Um, by repeatedly running the Sabal algorithm on different in indices i. And so, again, a, a caveat of this um, is that actually HSS is not perfectly correct. Um, and so this kind of uh, brings up some issues uh, when we want to use this. And, but, um, you know, given this uh, framework, basically our construction of, of reusable MPC basically proceeds in three steps. Okay, so the first step is kind of what I've been outlining is uh, been outlining is let's instantiate the GS18, um, the GS18 first round with this um, uh, with this HSS approach for generating many OT correlations. And so when we do that, um, basically we achieve this following primitive, which we call sharing compact um, multi-party HSS, um, because for one, recall that we're still in this in this dealer model because we're using this HSS. So here, we're going to assume a trusted dealer um, that has everybody's inputs. That dealer sends a single message to each of the parties. Uh, and then, you know, when these parties decide to compute a circuit, they can simply release uh, one extra message and uh, learn the value of the circuit. So, you know, these, these first dealer messages correspond um, to all of these pairwise correlations. Um, and are basically consist of the HSS shares that I showed on the last slide. Uh, the second messages basically correspond to the GS18 second round uh, message consisting of a, a whole sequence of garbled circuits. So, you know, the, the non-trivial property we get out of this is that the size of these, these DI messages are small, right? They just consist of these PRF keys and HSS shares. And in particular, um, they're independent of the size of the circuit that the parties can compute in the second round. Okay, and you might think that, well, because we're using a PRF to, to, to generate an unbounded number of correlations that actually this, this first message is reusable. Um, and they, these parties can then compute uh, more circuits in the second round. Um, turns out this is actually, this is not the case. Um, 
really this primitive only allows the parties to compute a single circuit of some unbounded polynomial size in the second round, but unfortunately it's not already reusable. Um, and the reason for that is actually due to this correctness error of HSS. And I won't get into exactly uh, why or how that comes up. Um, and you'll have to see the paper for that. But what we have achieved though is this primitive, which, which we call sharing compact HSS. And in order to achieve our ultimate goal of you know, reusable two round MPC, there's basically two issues we have to address. One is that we have this trusted dealer. And two is that this is actually not quite reusable yet. Um, and we'll address these in turn. So the second step uh, is showing um, basically how to remove uh, the dealer and turn this into a, uh, a two round MPC protocol. And we want to maintain like this, this nice property that um, the first round of the MPC protocol is small. And in particular, independent of the size of the circuit that the parties will compute in the second round. Okay, so here's like, yeah, this is the picture of what I had in the last slide. Um, in order to do this transformation, we're going to assume that we have a, a two-round MPC protocol that's not that doesn't satisfy any special properties. Okay, and we can uh, we can again get this. Uh, we can just take this to be GS18. Um, so a natural way to remove this dealer um, basically gives a three-round protocol. Okay, we'll simply use in the first and the second round we'll use pi to compute the dealer functionality. So at the end of the second round, everybody. Has, out, has as output their, their corresponding message di. And then they decide they want to compute c. They can release a single message mi that computes c. Okay, so this gives a three round protocol, right? But we want a two round protocol, so we'll kind of compress the second and third round together. Okay, and in order to do that, we're going to use garbled circuits. Um, so, you know, at a high level, what we'll do instead is we'll have this, this pi rather than um, just output the messages di in the clear, um, we're gonna have pi output uh, labels corresponding to these messages di, um, where each of these set of labels corresponds to a garbled circuit that will be released by each of these parties, okay? So while the parties in the second round, while the parties finish computing um, you know, the second round of pi, uh, they will also release a garbled circuit that basically computes the mapping from their, their uh, input di to their output mi. Um, and so if an evaluator, to basically to learn the output of this circuit, if you have these set of garbled circuits and you have the labels that, that came um, from the output of pi, then you can combine these to then learn the, uh, the mi's and then the results of the circuit. And this can all basically be done using this information that you get from um, the output of the second round. Okay, so this is kind of like a mini, I mean, it's a mini round, round collapsing compiler, um, similar to ideas that have been used, you know, for example, in GS GS18 and other works. Okay, um, so, you know, after completing this step, uh, what we've built is this, what we call a first message succinct two round MPC protocol, um, where it's not reusable yet, but it has this nice property that the first round, um, which is just you know, the first round of this, this protocol that's computing these DIs, uh, the first round, the computation and the uh, size of the messages output in the first round are completely independent of the size of the circuit to be computed in the second round. Um, so finally, although I, I really won't get a chance to talk about it, our third step is showing a generic transformation that uh, takes any first message succinct two round MPC protocol and produces a reusable two round MPC protocol. Um, and like, uh, you know, uh, I encourage you to see the paper for this, but it's basically based on ideas going all the way back to the, the, G, the classic GGM uh, PRF um, construction. And uh, also more recently, um, for example, this Dotling and Garg uh, IBE from DDH uh, uses similar ideas. And basically we're gonna, you know, you can imagine like a GGM tree, except that each node is going to be one instance of this first message succinct MPC. Um, and each leaf is actually an MPC that computes um, one of every possible polynomial size circuit. Um, so yeah, it's very high level and I won't get, really get a chance to go into the details, um, but this is, uh, yeah, based on some of these, um, you know, 
based on this idea from GGM um, that's also shown up in some some recent works. Okay. Um, so wrapping up, uh, you know, I think the main takeaway is this uh, reusability in two round MPC, or alternatively, um, really the, the minimal interaction pattern you can have in MPC. Um, the takeaway is it can be achieved without heavy hammers of obfuscation or fully holomorphic encryption. Okay. In fact, we show it can be achieved using, you know, a simple DDH assumption. And we really build on a lot of work that like builds uh, great tools from DDH. Um, so we need HSS from DDH. We also needed um, a PRF and NC1 from DDH um, with an hour angle PRF. And we also needed to use a two round MPC from DDH. Okay. Um, and the techniques we use, so, you know, we, we take ideas um, from these like garbled protocols um, that kind of started with uh, the work of Garg and Srinivasan. And uh, in the step I didn't really talk about, we kind of, we need this, what I'm calling this garbled tree, or we basically need a way to traverse a tree using a sequence of garbled circuits. And this idea has also come up in many recent works. Um, and finally, before I finish, I just want to, to mention quickly um, these two concurrent and independent works. So I already mentioned this work of Ben Hamuda and Lin. Um, so what they get is reusable MPC from pairings, um, right? So uh, a stronger assumption than us. However, uh, they do have the advantage, and this is, I'm calling this unbounded, but their advantage is that um, the first round message doesn't even depend on the number of parties in the system, okay? So for us, our, you know, the number of parties in the system is a parameter to the to even the first round message. But for them, uh, their first round message is independent of uh, not only the circuit but also the uh, the number of parties uh, to compute the circuit in the second round. Okay. And I also want to mention this work again, uh, the one that achieved, uh, um, you know, a reusable MPC from LWE in the plane model. Um, because they actually use a, a, a similar and essentially the same first message succinct to reusability transformation um, that we uh, used in step three. Okay. Um, and yeah, that, uh, that's all I wanted to say. So yeah, thanks, thanks for listening and uh, bearing, with, bearing with me through the interruptions. Uh, well, thanks for the talk, James. Uh, very interesting result. Um, Right now, there's nothing in the Q and A, but I would uh, have a question, which is uh, this: this round collapsing. Uh, you say that you get weaker assumptions, obviously, uh, uh, than than FAG. But did uh, did you or anyone look at the uh, asymptotic com uh, computation complexity? Uh, because even for FAG with uh, um, with using the bootstrapping, so how does that compare to the blow up that you get from this? Uh, double circuit technique that you have there. Yeah, so for computation, it's it's going to be it's certainly worse communication wise. Like we we it's and with FHE you can get actually succinct communication, yeah. right? And we don't we do not certainly don't have that here. And computation, uh, I mean, we didn't we didn't actually um, do a comparison, but I would suspect that we're some order of magnitude uh, worse than the FHE computation as well. Um, maybe some blow up in the circuit size. I mean, with FHE, you have to you have to you know at least pay for the circuit size times some mm -hmm. some other overhead. I'm assuming our overhead is worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Um, then thanks again uh, for the talk. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the uh, Q and A. James, can I just ask one quick question? Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thanks for the nice talk. Um, so did you think about whether it's possible to replace DDH with LPN by plugging in these two random correlation generators? Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, this is something I actually just been starting to think about recently, um, but, okay. uh, but very <laughs> recently, really it's just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a natural question, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you can do these silent yeah. OT extensions from LPN and things. So yeah, it's a great question. But it's not like it immediately follows. It doesn't appear to be immediate, yeah. There are some extra, I think, challenges there. Okay, thanks.